that the subject of uh, uh, edema and wetness in general as a term, as opposed to dryness, uh, wetness of the tissue. And I know Dr. Pete's always mentioned that tumours, uh, when they arise, are generally solid, but actually they have a, a higher than average water content. And uh, so that was part of later on this uh, later on this show's uh, discussion into uh, eye changes. Uh, mentioning things like uh, age-related macular degeneration in particular in glaucoma, also having very uh, high water concentrations and that being an interesting uh, component along with estrogen's uh, devastating effects. I uh, can't say enough about estrogen and how bad it is for women. We've done many shows regarding estrogen in the past and again, it, it'll bring up uh, the, the kind of sinister side of estrogen, if you like, and we've mentioned before uh, many times that the only real function for estrogen is for implantation of a fertilized ovum. Uh, outside of that, it wreaks quite a lot of havoc uh, in the female body. Uh, it also does nothing very good in a male body. So, uh, but especially with f- females, the uh, the advancing age in estrogen is a, a very negative and inflammatory molecule. So, uh, we'll bring out tonight's uh, subject of uh, estrogen in that context. Uh, linking it to HRT and that kind of stuff. The um, damaging effects of it, environmental estrogens that are found in such compounds as BPA uh, and other plastics that uh, have a uh, hormone mimicking uh, effects. Uh, yeah, when when the organism is exposed at a very early stage, uh, such as during gestation or infancy, um. The um, signals for development are changed so that the, uh, uh, especially the reproductive system is changed. Uh, but uh, besides changing the individual by giving it false signals, uh, the DNA is altered slightly by attaching methyl groups to it as part of that misguided uh, development. And that means that the um, uh, ability to express enzymes for the rest of its life will uh, be influenced unless it can somehow uh, remove those methyl groups. Uh, But typically they will last for three or four generations even without further change. Uh, So uh, the changes that happen to one individual can be passed on uh, for generations, altering the the fertility, for example, until uh, it can tend to, to cause the species to uh, just disappear. Okay, so what, what's your opinion about the, uh, the 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 amount of pollution that uh, we are as an organism exposed to directly from uh, estrogenic-like substances in the environment? Um, the what we know about. Uh, Certain areas, the Columbia River and the ocean off the mouth of the Columbia, for example, they're seeing lots of uh, fish, uh, uh, simpler uh, water organisms, uh, even mammals that are uh, sexually malformed and developing tumors. Mm. And uh, in, in Florida, there have been a lot of stories about uh, the swamp animals uh, that are becoming sterile, um, changing genders and so on. Uh, so uh, the um, news reported about human health, I think, isn't being uh, up to date or honestly reported right. because uh, what we see in the wild animals, uh, I think it un- undoubtedly is uh, affecting humans to a great degree too yeah. you, you think this could be so widespread and so endemic that it's almost uh, almost impossible for anyone to put a lid on it and that's why it's not being uh, exposed as much as it should be or uh, yeah because of the um, influence of the estrogen industry there's a terrific reluctance to admit that estrogen has these toxic effects right. even though it's been known for a hundred years yeah. but it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that uh, People have really been researching in an organized way uh, uh, influences such as these environmental uh, plastic uh, 
suppliers of chemicals and so on. And uh, the, uh, the influence of the uh, estrogen industry is simply uh, going to blame any effects they see on uh, such things as diet, uh, smoking too much, uh, a bad way of living, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, rather than the root cause. Well, I hope so. I mean, last month was a testimony, um, especially especially for me having a, a reasonably close working relationship with you over the last few years doing the show that you've been consistently mentioning how bad polyunsaturates are and finally it showed up in the medical literature that indeed what you've been saying is very true. And so <laughs> I know you've also said that whilst... Uh, a lie spreads around the world. In a moment, truth is still getting her boots on. So hopefully, in the not too distant future, they'll be uh, printing the same kind of things as you're saying about the uh, estrogens uh, in the environment and what we need to do um, to protect ourselves from it. A- another uh, subject around uh, estrogens, um, the association of heart failure and cardiac death. What, what, do you, what have you found from estrogen's effects on those subjects? Um, despite all of the um, oh, 40 years at least of uh, propaganda trying to sell estrogen to men to prevent heart attacks, for example, <laughs> uh-huh. they found that they died faster when they took estrogen. <laughs> uh, but Oops. they keep coming back trying to sell estrogen as a heart protective uh, hormone. Got and it. Uh, the Women's Health Initiative somewhat set that back by showing that uh, the uh, use of uh, estrogen replacement therapy for menopause uh, increased the number of uh, heart attacks as well as cancer and dementia. Uh, But despite that, they're still uh, hoping to uh, bring back their sales to the 2000 to level where they uh, dropped off so sharply. Uh, just in the last day or two, an article appeared uh, from uh, Yale Medical School uh, doing what they call a meta-analysis, meaning picking out some articles from uh, junky medical magazines uh-huh. and uh, analyzing them uh, for the... the type of results basically the way they want. Until the Women's Health Initiative, the medical journals for 20 or 30 years were just swamped with the um, heart protective benefits and the brain anti-Alzheimer's effect and even the anti-cancer effects of estrogen. And uh, despite the Women's Health Initiative, these people are now looking back at their journals and uh, drawing out of them uh, the kind of information they want. And uh, this uh, study, so-called published uh, by the Yale people, claims that uh, tens of thousands of women are dying unnecessarily by refusing to take their estrogen treatment <laughs> for menopause. No way. Oh, my goodness. When exactly the opposite is true, they've probably got a greater chance of living without it, huh? Um, yeah, and hearing it come from Yale... Uh, it reminds me of uh, about 40 years ago, uh, there was a daytime television program in which uh, Barbara Seaman debated a Yale professor of medicine. I suspect it's the same one that uh, <laughs> sponsored this recent study. And uh, she made him look like a complete ignoramus uh, because she knew the facts and he was just quoting the the medical doctrine. Uh, I suspect that Yale is now having its revenge because uh, Barbara Seaman is dead. Uh (laughs) Okay. Well, let me just remind people uh, who they're listening to here. So uh, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. And from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated to this month's subject. Our guest speaker is Dr. Raymond Peake, uh, and the number is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, 1-800-KMUD-RAD, and the lines will be open from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. 
Okay, so Dr. Pete, again, uh, we'll just carry on a little bit more with the, um, the subject of estrogen uh, because I know that you mentioned that uh, varicose veins uh, were an, a fairly important outward sign or a visible sign uh, of the lowered ratio of progesterone being the good hormone, the healthy anti-inflammatory hormone. So it's a sign of lowered progesterone to estrogen. What, what, have you, uh, what have you to say about that? Um, although estrogen is a cell excitant, it, uh, in the process of uh, stimulating uh, one kind of cell activity, <clears throat> uh, tends to make it retain water. The individual cell uh, stays excited uh, too long uh -huh. and... In the process of being excited, the cell admits water, and uh, it has to relax uh, a certain length of time to expel the water. Right. And so under the influence of too much unopposed estrogen, uh, cells tend to get more and more waterlogged. And even though they're excited, uh, they uh, progressively lose the ability to contract fully because uh, in contracting, the, the protein mechanism has to be uh, interacting with itself rather than pushing against a swollen uh, amount of water. Right. And uh, that means that in a, a muscle such as the wall of a vein, under the influence of uh, high estrogen and low progesterone, testosterone, and so on, uh, the wall of the vein becomes waterlogged and uh, can't contract periodically to maintain its tone. And uh, the same thing happens in uh, nerves, um, heart muscle, uh, everywhere in the body that estrogen is able to uh, have its influence. And uh, in these estrogen-dominated cells, uh, the ability to contract uh, becomes uh, progressively weaker. Albert St. Georgi uh, demonstrated the effect of estrogen and progesterone on heart muscles uh, over 50 years ago and uh, showed that uh, under the influence of progesterone, if you stimulate the heart at an increasing frequency, each stroke becomes Stronger, okay. so it is uh, an efficient way to respond to frequent stimulation. Right. It relaxes in between, uh, gathers its equipment together, and then has a bigger contraction uh, under the influence of progesterone. But if it's influenced or dominated by estrogen, it's unable to accumulate uh, that information that the stimulation is increasing in frequency. So the estrogenized heart will respond uh, to, to the fast stimulation by just more of the same weak little contraction. Hmm. Uh, so this and th th that's basically how a failing heart behaves. Right, behave. right. I was just going to ask you that. Okay, so that's, that's a typical picture of, of a, just a gradually aging, failing heart that it, uh, it's not allowed to, uh, uh, the, the excitatory stage is too long, it's not allowed to re relax or repolarize and uh, remove the water, and it just gradually gets weaker and more feeble. You mentioned in your response to that last question that uh, uh, progesterone and testosterone, th these are two compounds that will oppose the action of estrogen, and, and, and presumably then they would be useful for uh, people that had, not just women perhaps, but people that had estrogen dominant type uh, pathologies or, or, or you know, conditions? Um, that's, it's now being recognized that uh, testosterone has an anti-cancer uh, value as well. Just recently, oh, okay. uh, another study came out showing that a testosterone deficiency uh, is a strong predisposer to prostate cancer okay okay well let's talk about let's talk about uh, testosterone a little bit then as that's a fairly uh, fairly pertinent topic 
I, I know that you've, um, when, when we've talked in the past about uh, the best way to go about exercising, you've always mentioned uh, non-stressful exercise. So you don't advocate the aerobic type uh, gymnasium workout where you get your heart rate up to 160 and you're breathing rapidly and um, that's not what you want. You want weight-bearing exercise that doesn't make you breathless. And I know you've said in the past that that kind of exercise increases your ability to produce muscle and it's the muscle that's so important in basically helping you to maintain a good stable weight but that muscle also uh, through the action of thyroid uh, enables your body to metabolize things more efficiently because it's, uh, it, it's, it's way more of a useful substance in your body than the fat of an unhealthy or unexercised person. Um, and the muscle also metabolizes the steroid hormones, and uh, with exercise, it can actually secrete testosterone. Uh, but in uh, the resting mus- the muscle idle secrete? or stressed muscle, uh, without adequate uh, stimulation from uh, good food and thyroid, uh, muscles produce a lot of estrogen in one study, uh, they were using the blood draining from a monkey's arm to uh, as a control comparison for the blood coming out of the ovary. They found that the monkey's arm was producing as much estrogen as its ovary. And uh, that, that uh, probably isn't uh, a good representative of the average person, but uh, because the, the monkey was anesthetized and so on and under the influence of stress and chemicals. But uh, basically any stress tissue is going to uh, tend to produce estrogen. But a well-exercised, strong muscle begins producing testosterone and stops producing estrogen. Wow. So so muscles in their own right can secrete testosterone? Uh, Yes. Ah, okay, I think I was always under the impression that in the, in the male, uh, the main site of testosterone production would be the uh, testes. But um, is, is there anywhere else in the body that um, testosterone can be secreted from? Is it? Is it? Um, yeah, I think the skin uh, is known to produce wow. uh, uh, testosterone among other steroid hormones. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a, a fairly. It might be the body's biggest endocrine. Right. Synthetic factory. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we often forget about the skin being the largest organ of the body, but that's true enough. Okay. Uh, I have another I have another question for you and, and again it's kind of related um to cholesterol. Um I know that you've uh, mentioned a previous study that uh positively associated an improved outcome from heart failure in relation to an increased cholesterol level. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, that pretty much can be generalized to other muscles. Uh, everyone is hearing the bad news about uh, the anti-cholesterol drugs uh, that uh, cause muscle breakdown. Right. Uh, sometimes the muscle breaks down so completely that uh, the uh, proteins leaking from the, the broken down muscle uh, poison the kidneys and can even kill the person. <laughs> But uh, that's because their uh, cholesterol is a stabilizing factor for the skeletal muscles, and if you stop uh, cholesterol synthesis, uh, the muscles are very susceptible to damage. And those same processes are known to occur simultaneously in the heart muscle. Uh, the uh, the leakage of those proteins that can damage the kidneys, uh, they always assume it is coming from the skeletal muscles, but uh, the heart under those uh, chemicals is known to uh, leak the same proteins. Mm. Okay, interesting. Okay, I think I've got one, one or two more questions, and then we'll get into the, uh, the, current, uh, the, the current interest that you have in looking at the uh, similarities or the links between uh, cancers and uh, tissue tissue states, the wetness especially with uh, 
uh, eye disease. So that, that'll be a, that'll be a, 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 a new and interesting uh, look at the approach to treatment for uh, age-related macular degeneration, for instance. Um, I just had another couple of questions um, related to cancer. Um, I know you've had in your previous newsletter you've mentioned uh, the link between um, hypoxia, which is a kind of oxygen oxygen deficit, and cancer. Um, yeah, yeah, the um, thing that's in the research a lot lately is the uh, hypoxia inducible factor, which is a protein that shows up. Uh, first, they were seeing it uh, wherever they cut off the oxygen supply, but that same protein can really be induced by cutting off the glucose supply too. So mm. it really should be called the the energy deprivation yeah. uh, protein. They, they call it by its name, its initials, HIF, hypoxia inducible factor. Huh. So it's not it's so, a, it's not so much related to oxygen deprivation as sugar deprivation. Uh, yeah, energy deprivation. Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, that has been studied primarily in relation to, to cancer and finding ways to block that uh, protein production. But it turns out that just getting enough glucose and oxygen delivered to the tissue is a very simple way to inhibit that, that protein. So, so tell that me this. protein turns on all of the bad processes. Uh, team oxygen ace would... Uh, carbon monoxide production, nitric oxide synthase, uh, lactic acid production, prostaglandin uh, production causing inflammation, activating aromatase and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lactic acid in turn activates the HIF hypoxia factor. So it, once it gets started, the inflammation tends to promote more inflammation and hypoxia. Right. Now, uh, forgive me for for being being uh, thoughtless, perhaps, but uh, hypoxia as a state of low oxygen um, and being a being a, a negative thing, which is what we always normally would associate a low oxygen status with, being dangerous and uh, life threatening. I know you've always promoted um, a, a CO2, a carbon dioxide rich environment, as being a uh, uh, beneficial uh, cellular matrix, as it were, to have a uh, higher carbon dioxide content. So what would necessarily, I mean, I know you've mentioned that the hypoxia-inducible factor you've just talked about is probably more accurately termed a glucose uh, lack, but is if there if anything really negative about hypoxia, hypoxia? If you think of the hypoxia as turning on lactic acid, which then turns on all of these other uh, inflammatory signals, uh, right. and then you see that Got it. carbon dioxide turns off the production of lactic acid. Uh, it. Simply the ability to turn off lactic acid production is one of the basic protective uh, features of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Okay, good. It's, it's the association then between lactic acid and carbon dioxide that's the important thing. Okay. All right. You're listening to Ask Your Web Doctor on KMD Garbo 91.1 FM. And from now until 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated to this month's subject of the heart, hormones, and cancer, and the eyes. Okay. The number, if you live in the area, is 923-3911. Or if you're outside the area, the 1-800 number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. And our special guest speaker is Dr. Raymond Pete. Okay, so I think we'll probably uh, get into the uh, the next subject, uh, of which um, I think you're probably going to be writing a newsletter at, the, at some point here, maybe, but um, as yet you haven't. Um, so that I know when we've spoken, you've mentioned that uh, your research is showing that um, wetness, as opposed to dryness, the wetness uh, in the eye uh, associated with cataracts is the same kind of wetness that's found in tumours, uh, is found in the heart during heart failure and also in, in the brain during uh, brain disease. Um, yeah, uh, despite the fact that uh, the uh, failing heart becomes hardened, even calcified, and uh, tumors 
are stiffer than healthy tissue, uh, and even with age, uh, in a, a very serious dementia, the, the brain can become sort of rubbery with so many connective tissue cells. Despite the fact that the tissue is becoming firmer, uh, these thick uh, degenerative states actually contain more water so that if you dry a piece of the organ, uh, it loses much more weight than a, a healthy organ would okay. uh, in relation to the uh, given amount of nuclear nucleic acid and uh, proteins and so on. Uh, these degenerative tissues uh, have a, a very high percentage of water, but besides the actual percentage of water, the water changes state um, and becomes uh, relatively more like free bulk water. Huh. It, can, it can be frozen where the, the healthy cell uh, is functioning somewhat as an uh, antifreeze, uh, binding the, the water so that it isn't as uh, free to move out of the cell or to uh, be frozen or uh, otherwise subject to influence. Do, do, you, do you think, we do actually have a couple of callers on the line, but do you, just quickly to um, rephrase what you said, do, are you saying that the uh, water found in these tissues uh, during these type of pathologies is not, uh, is not electrically the same as regular water? Um, well, if, if you freeze, say you have a, a land that has cataracts in it mm -hmm. and uh, has a much higher percentage of water, per protein molecule, yeah. uh, and if you uh, freeze that, it'll crystallize uh, easier than a healthy lens, and uh, this can be studied at, in an um, MRI machine uh, because the you can very clearly see the difference between the water that's bound firmly to the cell in the way it should be or the water that's just sitting there uh, as excess useless water huh. plugging up the cell function. Huh. Interesting. All right, well, let, let's not keep these callers. We've got, I think we've got three callers on the line now, so let's, let's take the first caller. We had another person that didn't want to wait, but she wanted to know if black cohosh was effective for menopause. Okay, so a bit of a convoluted question because black cohosh is typically used in the literature for uh, menopause, uh, decreasing night sweats. But I think there is also a lot of research coming out of Europe which actually prevents the uh, use of black cohosh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as a kind of uh, more of a kind of estrogen stimulant. So I've always uh, kind of viewed black cohosh with a little bit of uh, caution. Um, it's not something that I would say straight away would be uh, useful, but um, there are other ways to lower your uh, estrogen state because the, the whole point of the uh, black cohosh was that it was more of an estrogen replacement. Um, so, I've heard some ideas that it was um, an anti-prolactin factor. I don't know what the current state of that idea is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure about that either, Dr. Pete. And what did you say, Sue? She wanted to know what the best herb would be for menopause or herbs. Uh, well, really, it's, it's, it's probably as much about your uh, excess estrogen as anything else. I know, Dr. Pete, um, in terms of menopause, you would probably suggest that um, excess estrogen is one of the main causes and to bring that down into line with the anti-estrogen hormone pregnenolone or progesterone would probably be the most uh, efficient way of doing it. And usually thyroid. To, right. Uh, right. The, uh, cholesterol tends to rise at menopause, and, and if, if thyroid is adequate, uh, that will keep turning the cholesterol into more of the pregnenolone right. and progesterone to protect against estrogen. Right. Good. Okay, so there's another caller on the line. So let's take this next caller. You're on the air. Hello, this is David. Um, you know, and I know this is kind of a a deep subject and I've heard you ask questions before about water Andrew and, and I, I've read different things that Dr. Pete has written about like poly water and different types of more structured water and I'm just curious I, you you asked the question just a minute ago and I don't know if I understood the answer but when we have these tissues that are experiencing edema 
and we have, you know, what we're calling H2O, is that water considered to not be structured at its optimum? And uh, in, in line with that, a, a kind of a, a similar question is, it seems like I've heard that, um, I, I think I've heard this from Dr. Pete and these different discussions, that do we produce our own water at times, and is that a more structured water? And then the other question is, like, when we drink orange juice, or we drink milk and say we're drinking raw milk versus pasteurized milk, is the water content within those foods, is that considered a, a very optimum structured water? Okay, Dr. Pete, did, did um, you hear those questions clearly? Or? Uh, yeah. Uh, there are, uh, my, my article on uh, the poly water question uh, talks about some of the the, the ranges of influence, how far a certain surface can influence a structure such as in clay. Uh, the, the water in ordinary clay is structured differently from bulk water. But uh, there's also a, a question of how long the uh, influence of that surface can last. Uh, Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington has uh, there are some videos on the internet that you can see his demonstrations of uh, some of the odd behavior of water, even in a, a fairly uh, bulk situations. Uh, but ordinarily, it, it doesn't make any difference whether you drink uh, uh, water that has been boiled recently or frozen recently. Uh, it's mostly a matter of degassing that that makes it behave differently according to its recent history. Uh, so it's, it's safe to drink uh, oh, tea or coffee water that's been boiled. Uh, but what matters is the state of the water inside the cell, and that's governed by the energy of the metabolism and the ratio of things like carbon dioxide to lactic acid. Um, in the lens, the proteins uh, in other hard tissues, uh, collagen is the main protein that gives it stiffness, but in the lens, the main protein is called uh, crystalline, and uh, it happens that crystalline is very well ordered with reference both to the structure of water and to the wavelength of visible light. So the, the water surrounding these proteins in the lens is uh, so well ordered that it doesn't interfere with or reflect or absorb the light passing through it. Mm. So it's an essential protein yeah. uh, for maintaining the transparency of the lens. And uh, this protein, if you compare it to collagen or albumin or other common proteins, uh, the protein can bind very firmly uh, much more water, about twice as much water as other proteins, uh, and hold it under its influence. Uh, so uh, really the, the water of the lens and the protein is in a tight system in a normal state, but when uh, the energy processes fail and you uh, absorb Influences such as estrogen, polyunsaturated fats, uh, lactic acid, uh, various toxins, then uh, the energy is uh, unable to repair the system and the, uh, the water uh, gets out of control of these proteins and uh, starts becoming uh, ordinary bulk water that uh, interferes with with the uh, passage of light and, and lets uh, junk accumulate, such as broken down fragments of polyunsaturated fats, acrolein, for example, breaking down from the N-3 proteins is a major factor in, in a cataract formation. Okay. <clears throat> I want to make sure that um, fairly quickly, because we do have a couple more callers, but that last caller also asked if we produce our own water and is the water in milk and OJ uh, an optimum type of water? Um, 
Yeah, the the water that has been uh, filtered through an orange tree or a cow, it, it's at least <clears throat> very purified compared to a water you get out of the city <laughs> <Good>. plumbing. Because <laughs> uh, I, I know you're not very keen on water, just per se drinking water. You'd much rather people drink something that has nutritional value. But... Yeah, and we do make uh, quite a bit of water metabolically uh, when we eat carbohydrates uh, in particular. Uh, the um, We turn uh, some of the uh, oxygen uh, that we are using to produce energy, some of that uh, becomes water. Mm -hmm. And uh, the metabolic water uh, is, is just uh, intermixing uh, with the water that we get from uh, the food itself. Uh, but the the nature of the uh, uh, oxygens contained in carbohydrates uh, can influence the, uh, uh, the metabolism of the cell. Uh, the hydrogens as well as the oxygen uh, are a mixture of isotopes of different weight in uh, everything that that we eat or consist of, uh, we have a mixture of these uh, different weight isotopes. And uh, heavy water, deuterium mm -hmm. oxide, mm -hmm. it slows down our metabolism. So there's a slight difference in the water that we get uh, from uh, tropical sugar versus beet sugar that's grown up in a, a high altitude uh -huh. uh, because of the... Wow. Uh, Rainfall is uh, separating the heavy water from the light water. <laughs> Interesting. So that there is a slight difference in the, the quality of the water, depending on where the fruit grows. Yeah. Far out. Hey, Andrew, I, and I know I'm going to say this real quick. If, I'm sorry, but uh, I just want to make sure I understand one thing. So in a way, the water, like you are talking about in the lens of the eye, it's structured so that it's almost like crystalline and that it actually structures the different materials that are that it's intermingling with? Um, well, the, the protein structures the water, and then the water admits uh, things selectively. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, hey, thank you for that. Uh, that that's really interesting. But thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your call. Okay. We have two more callers, so let's take the next caller. You're on the air? Where are you calling from? Oh, hey, I'm calling from uh, just uh, Laytonville down here. Okay. And uh, I'll be real quick. I know you got another call, and a uh, great show. Very, very interesting here. Thank you. Uh, I hate to backtrack here, but I take about uh, 100 milligrams of uh, metropolol. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a cholesterol thing. I've been taking it every day for like five years. I also take uh, isis sorbide. It's a time-release nitroglycerin, you know, for my heart. Right, you have angina. Uh, I've or... had like uh, seven heart attacks in the last nine years. I'll take my answer off the air, but uh, with this much metropolol, uh, is this something I should be concerned about? Should I, uh, you know, like talk to my doc about it? Okay, Dr. P, what do you think about that? I, I don't know that drug. Do you know what class it is? Uh, I don't either. One moment. I don't know if the call is still there or not. Hi. Did you did you uh, ask hear Dr. P? He was asking if you knew what kind of what class of drug metropolol was in. Uh, I, t I take it for my cholesterol. That's all I know. Right. Yeah. I'm not too sure. Um, uh, the, the only safe way I know to uh, lower cholesterol uh, chronically is by increasing thyroid function. Uh, in 1936 or seven, uh, people demonstrated that uh, if you remove a person's thyroid gland, uh, their cholesterol level goes up as a mirror image of their oxygen consumption going down. And when you give them a thyroid supplement, the uh, cholesterol will fall as the oxygen consumption increases. Uh, that's a very simple mechanism that uh, doctors uh, prefer to prescribe drugs with a toxic side effects, and uh, just lowering the cholesterol, even if the drug didn't have other side effects, uh, the cholesterol is normally destined to turn into DHEA 
uh, progesterone, testosterone, and so on. And so if you push down the availability of cholesterol by any mechanism, you're going to tend to deprive the body of those steroids that it should be forming. All right. Hey, you guys are great, man. Thanks for all the information. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, good night. Good night. Okay, so uh, were there any more callers on the air, Sue? Yeah, one more. Okay, so let's take this next caller. You're on the air? Oh, okay, they've gone. <laughs> okay, they've hung up. Okay, well, the number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the number's 1-800-KMUD-RAD, and the lines are open till 8 o'clock. Uh, so, guest speaker, Dr. Raymond P., uh, we're covering his uh, latest work on uh, the similarities between the uh, component or structural components of cataracts, uh, the uh, conditions like uh, macular degeneration, uh, tumors, and uh, heart failure in terms of the heart muscle. So uh, I just wanted to ask you this next... Oh, was there... We had two very shy callers that didn't want to go on the air. Okay. And one question is um, regarding the thyroid um, supplements, does it matter if it's T or T3? That's one question. And then I'll ask the other one. Okay. All right. Well, th- there's there's two. There's T4 and T3. So um, it would it would very much matter, uh, depending on what their situation was, which one they may or may not be short of. So um, it, it's, Dr. P, how would you best answer this? Because uh, this is your... This is your subject. Uh, well, if uh, the uh, study that led to the substitution of thyroxin or T4 for the natural combination T3 and T4 was a test on uh, male medical students, <laughs> average age in the early 20s, <laughs> okay. and being male, uh, they didn't have the uh, uh, problems that... Uh, Typically, females have about five or ten times the incidence of thyroid problems. So <laughs> they tested thyroxin on a, a population that was extremely inappropriate for testing a thyroid product. And they said it works just like natural thyroid. And since it was a, a commercial proprietary material, uh, they preferred it to the natural product. But uh, <laughs> okay. after about 10 or 15 years, the uh, actual active hormone, T3, was identified and studied. And it was found that this is what uh, women lack typically, causing them to have five or ten times the thyroid problems that men do. Because estrogen interferes with the gland's secretion of both T4 and T3 but it especially interferes with the liver's ability to convert right. thyroxin to the active hormone T3. Right. Uh, so many women uh, actually get worse uh, symptoms when they take thyroxin because it suppresses the little bit of T3 that their thyroid gland is producing, uh, yet doesn't uh, add to the uh, amount of T3 that should be produced by the liver. Okay, excellent. And there's another reason yeah. why the excess estrogen found in uh, postmenopausal women or even uh, even menstruating women uh, works against them, or works against their thyroid? I didn't hear that. Okay, I, I just said that that's the, the main reason why um, menstruating or postmenopausal women are at more risk in terms of low thyroid function. Um, yeah, and uh, some of the uh, typically... Uh, female problems such as endometriosis are uh, just amazingly responsive to the proper uh, thyroid supplementation yeah. because uh, once the thyroid goes down, then estrogen goes up. Right. And since the estrogen blocks thyroid action, it becomes a vicious circle. Yeah, got it. Okay, well, there is another caller on the air, so let's um, see if... Well, no, it's the caller who didn't want to go on the air, but they wanted to know um, what the effects of cannabinoids are on cancer. Dr. Pete. Oh, on cancer, I think people are still uh, exploring that. Uh, There are some suspicions that it might actually slow cancer growth. Others worry that it might... Uh, make it worse, but mostly it's used uh, to prevent the stress symptoms, right. and, and for that it's uh, effective. 
So what do you, what do you th- just, just talking about that a little bit more, um, in terms of, uh, as much as anything else helping me understand more about it um because again i think i'm probably on the fence in terms of not knowing enough one way or the other but in, in terms of the plant and its relationship to hops um both in the cannabaceae hops express a lot of pro estrogenic compounds which is why the hop pickers during hop picking in august in england would lose their periods uh, such was it its powerful effects on the hormone system uh, do you look at um do you look at those compounds as being pro estrogenic and if you do oh how, definitely hops, yeah. hops is a very powerful estrogen right um, how, how how is there any similarity given that the plants in the same family i i'm sure there's a a lot of overlap uh, almost every plant has some estrogenic or anti-estrogenic material, but uh, mostly they're estrogenic because it's a defensive material that, uh, for example, acts like birth control pills for predators. <laughs> uh, the um, known effects of heavy marijuana smoking are uh, definitely estrogenic, but some of that could just be that the any kind of smoke is estrogenic. Right. Right. And is, is there any parallel? Um, I know carbon monoxide is, uh, is present in abundant quantities when you smoke. Is, is there any way? And I, I've seen blood work from, uh, clients, um, who are smokers. They, they always seem to have a pretty high CO2, which you would say is a good thing. Is, is there a beneficial? I don't saying smoking's good and we should all start smoking, but, um, is, is there anything more simplistic or is there something you know more uh, more dangerous at work than uh, just getting a little bit of extra co2 in your system oh well uh, the um, carbon monoxide uh, can accumulate and and have some uh, chronic harmful effects such as uh, on the liver function uh, but I think the real danger of smoke is the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are inflammatory and estrogenic and carcinogenic. Just anything you burn is going to produce some of those. And then uh, any smoke of a plant material is going to produce some dioxin-type material. Right. Okay. Um, I, I certainly do have... More I want to ask you about the uh, in terms of your your work looking at uh, uh, tissues and wetness and tumors, um, but for fear of for fear of running over the show, uh, I don't want to uh, ask any more callers on the air. I think we do have a couple waiting, um, but um, I think we're going to carry this one on next month. I think there's enough interest in it certainly to to bring out uh, more callers. So, Dr. P, I think. Uh, It'll give me an opportunity to let people know more about you, um, and I'll thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Hope you've got a better line. <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. I, I'm sorry for the listeners who've, uh, who've perhaps uh, found a little difficulty in hearing, Dr. Pete, and I'm sorry, Dr. Pete, that you've had uh, difficulty hearing as well. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up the show, the next few minutes that we have, uh, Dr. Raymond Pete uh, has a website, and his address is www.raypeat.com. Uh, it has something in excess of 50 or more scientific journal articles uh, that are fully referenced scientifically, so uh, it's not just hearsay. Uh, he's been, uh, why do you call it, he's been crying out loud from a distance for quite some time now. Uh, I'm glad that people are uh, hearing what he has to say, and I'm glad that he's being vindicated by current scientific literature uh, being in accord with what he's been mentioning for 20 or 30 more years. So his website there, raypeat.com, is an excellent source of information. I um, would encourage you very much to go check it out. Uh, for those people that have uh, tuned into this show, thanks so much for calling. Uh, it's always always very helpful that you call in and that we know that the people out there that are listening and want to know more. I think it's always good to have that uh, kind of doubtful mind that wants to seek out more information and uh, not just be fed what it is that comes through the TV um, 
and in you know from adverts and uh, commercial newspapers etc so our toll free number is 1888 wbm herb uh, Sarah or I uh, can be reached Monday through Friday, or maybe Sarah can't at this point in time, folks. I guess she has a baby. <laughs> I've got to start thinking that she's uh, right there right now. But okay, but I can be reached Monday through Friday, nine to five uh, consultations or whatever at the end of the show. And if you have other questions uh, relating to this uh, month's show, that would be fine too. Okay, so thanks so much for joining us, and uh, for those people that have ears, let them hear. <laughs>